So imagine that you're the victim of a burglary or, or there's some other serious crime gone in, in, in your neighbourhood. Then the, the police would come in and they'd, they'd search for different kinds of evidence. Obviously your burglar's going to be wearing shoes, so he's going to leave behind a shoe print. Currently what they do is, is quite varied. So either they will, they will get a suspect into custody and they will get them to stand on some kind of ink pad and then stamp on a piece of paper. This is a copy of my shoe print that was that was taken using this method. So what, what I did was I stood on a on a, a vegetable dye impregnated pad and then stand or walk across this piece of paper. What the police would be looking for is signs of wear on, on the particular shoe. So they can they can identify a shoe type quite readily from the from the tread pattern underneath it. So Nike or Adidas? Or... So yeah, so it's, it, they, they're, they're quite familiar with the different kinds of shoes that people wear and they, they can classify them quite easily. But it turns out that the way we wear our shoe down is actually quite specific to us. So we all have a slightly different gait, we walk in slightly different ways. The Converse shoes, which are the ones that I'm wearing, are actually quite notorious for wearing in these kinds of regions, underneath where the ball of the foot is, as you, as you can imagine. So the, the soles are, are actually fairly thin. And what you see is you see distortion of these patterns in this kind of area. Um, as the shoe gets older, they also tend to wear in this kind of area as well. So you can see quite specific things due to the individual. The problem with acquiring images like this is that what they have to do is, is they have to take something like this and they, they scan it into a computer. There can be quite a long period between actually acquiring an image, in, an, an image like this and actually uploading it to a national footwear database. It's very similar to the kind of fingerprint databases that we're all familiar with from things like CSI. The idea is that what they will be able to do is they'll be able to take marks acquired from crime scenes, upload them into this database, take marks acquired from people in custody, and then try and match them. So if you've got somebody who's been committing crimes around the country, all the different forces can upload these images and you can search them against that and maybe place people at different crime scenes. The FBI expert can determine the make of a shoe and frequently, depending on the way the shoe is worn, such facts as the occupation of the wearer. The vegetable ink thing can be quite smudgy. There are also maybe uh, a few compliance issues associated with getting people to do this, as there are with any kind of um, evidence gathering process. But it's, it's largely due to time. Forensic services have had their budgets slashed. There's an increasing push to improve efficiency. And you can imagine if you're somebody working in a custody suite on a Saturday night or a Friday night, these are quite busy times. You might not have time to process the evidence as quickly as you might like to. The conversation that we had with them was around the area of trying to acquire these images digitally in custody. The idea being that you could, you could get the person to stand on some device, you could acquire an image of the regions where their shoes contact a surface. That could, you could press a button and that information, those images could be quickly uploaded to this national footwear database. They could be searched almost immediately and you can make a decision as to whether or not to detain or release. The way we decided to tackle this was actually using a, a fairly nice piece of physics, which is covered in most GCSE syllabuses. So the, the approach that we've used is actually based on um, total internal reflection. This is a piece of perspex, and what we've done is we've wrapped these LED strips around the outside of it. So if I just plug this in, so these LED strips light up, Okay, so those are the LED strips. Okay, so the, the LEDs run all the way up here, and what we've done is we've wrapped them around the outside of this piece of perspex. And then what we've done is we've, we've basically covered that up with, in this case, a piece of masking tape. Now, you can see me through this device. Okay, so what's happening is the light's bouncing around inside this, so it's been totally internally reflected inside this piece of perspex. But if I now bring something like my thumb into contact with the surface of this, then what you see is my thumb scatters quite a lot of light and all of a sudden you can see the contact regions between my thumb and the piece of perspex. So if I do it with my hand, for example, you can see all the regions where my, my palm is touching that, that piece of perspex. So you can imagine if you did this with your shoe, you would see a similar kind of pattern. And of course, if you were to walk across an element like this, then what you would see is that the intensity pattern would change and you would get an, an image or a movie of the regions where your shoe 
is contacting this piece of perspex. So the idea is very simple. Suppose we have something like a surface where on one side we've got glass or plastic and then on the other side we've got air. Now if we were to send in a beam of light towards that surface we would see two things. Firstly we would see a reflected ray, a reflected beam and if, the, if we say that this angle of incidence is theta i then we would see the same angle on reflection so we're going to call that theta r and in this case theta i and theta r are the same. We'd see another thing as well and that's a transmitted ray so we get a reflected ray and we get a refracted ray and this refracted ray comes out at a slightly different angle theta 2 and that angle theta 2 is bigger than the angle theta i by virtue of the fact that the refractive indices of the air and the glass are different. If we extend this idea and we make this angle of incidence bigger, what happens is that this angle theta 2 will continue to increase in size and eventually what will happen is you'll end up with a situation where that ray will basically move parallel to that surface as we make this angle bigger. So there's a critical angle at which this refracted ray will run across that interface. Beyond that critical angle at which this occurs, what will happen is the, the light will be totally internally reflected. All of the light will be reflected back inside the glass block. So this critical angle of incidence, which we'll call theta c, is fairly easy to calculate if we know what the two refractive indices are. So if we say that the refractive index of the glass, the plastic, is n2, and the refractive index of the air is n1, then the sine of that critical angle is just going to be equal to n1 divided by n2. This is the condition where we don't have anything in contact with the, with the glass or the plastic that I, that I talked about just now. If we bring a contacting object in, such as a, a, a shoe sole, what that does is it changes this condition. And in these regions where I'm contacting the glass surface with the shoe, I now have a different refractive index. You have a new n. So I have a new n, let's call it n3. Okay, so now this condition, this kind of critical angle, changes. Under the right conditions, light is no longer now totally internally reflected, but some light can actually escape and, if you like, move into the sole of the shoe. But that's do not doing you any good if it hits the sole of the shoe. Well, it's, it is if, that's, if that shoe is also quite a good scatterer of light. So if, if, if the, the sole material scatters light, then what will happen is that some of that light that goes in will actually be scattered back down in this direction. So if we were to put a camera at the bottom, we could image these regions where the, the shoe was actually contacting the sole. Okay, so this is Cinderella. So this is the, the device that we've been prototyping to use with the local police force. And this is actually a device for imaging um, the shoe prints using the technique that I've just talked about. What we've got here is, is a very, very similar design, but it's, it's, it's actually much larger. We've got a big piece of acrylic, and again, we've wrapped LEDs around the outside of it. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna step up onto this thing. Okay, and so I'm, for now, because I'm in a lab, I'm gonna to have to do something to try and remove the background lighting. If you look at the screen now, you can see the regions where my shoes are contacting the surface. They light up quite brightly in the same way that they did on the piece of acrylic that we were playing with earlier. We can capture images like this and use them to obtain a print, if you like, a copy of, of the contact regions where my, sh where my shoe is actually touching this. And this is the kind of thing that we would compare to a mark that we would find at a crime scene. So we can see as I move around, I get bright spots and dark spots. Okay, so these images that we can see on the top left hand side, they're, they're images that are produced by thresholding these images that we saw when we were imaging just now. So these are the kinds of things that you would compare to um, a mark that you would find at a crime scene. And they look quite a lot like um, a fingerprint that you, you, that you would store digitally for, for good reason, because the way they search them is actually very similar to the way that they would search a fingerprint. The images at the bottom here are provide complementary information. So these are actually taken using conventional lighting. And what they do is they just give us a photograph of the underside of the shoe. And these are useful 
because they also provide information about stuff that's perhaps not in contact. For example, that you've got uh, something like a stone or a piece of glass embedded in the bottom of your shoe, which is not showing up in the contact regions, but which would make a difference if you were to make an impression in soft mud. So that, that again provides you with additional information if you're looking at a different kind of image. That, well, that looks like a keyhole but they definitely can't get the key in there. It is a pretend keyhole. Okay. The weak point in all of these is the locking mechanisms, so therefore you hide the lock. So the keyhole must be somewhere else. Oh, hang on. What's Aha. this? There's a panel here on top. I literally just found this. I wasn't pretending for the camera. There we go. Oh, this is very Scooby-Doo. This is good, isn't it? Very yeah. Scooby-Doo.